<laughs> Guess what I got? What do you got? Ah, hey, a bell! Yeah. Oh my God, where's my bell? Oh, I moved, I moved my bell. I don't have a bell. I gotta. I'm gonna keep it special. I'm not gonna do too much, but jeez, I re- to- it's hard. It's really hard to explain. It was extremely hard to explain to my daughter. But I I just had to say, well, you know, honey, there's just some times when I'm talking on the internet and I really want to hit a fucking bell. I didn't say it. I I didn't say it in those words, but I I said it in that more kind of like really ridiculous way you talk to a child. But John, I, I, you know, I've, I've been cynical about your candles and bells, but sometimes Mm -hmm. you you just just need to hit hit a goddamn bell. Am I right? Am I right? I, you know, I had no idea. It's like not having a microwave. You sit around, you go, oh, why, why would you want a way to make soup faster? And then you go, oh, oh I don't my. even watch TV. Mm. Oh, sorry. Is there something I need to own a coffee maker to understand? Yeah. And yeah. then you get a bell next to your computer. And yeah. a couple times a day, you punctuate uh, some triumph. With so, a, with tri- a little... tri- triumph with a lowercase t. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. You don't punctuate a, 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 <laughs> the, band, the band or the motorcycle or the car. You punctuate... <laughs> You just punctuate a lowercase yeah. t triumph with a little with a little sound. And you know, actually, I, I don't want to derail this, but I, I, I actually, I think I'm going to start a new stack, which is going to be the things we don't talk about. Hmm. Oh, the things that we're going to circle back to. Well, no, well, gosh, no, that's a really big pile. <laughs> you know, I have actually an entire, I don't smoke, but I have an entire cigar box full of cards just from this show that I would be happy to go through hmm. with you at some point. But no, I, I think triumph is something like kiss is something to avoid. Right. Triumph, like, the insult comic dog. <laughs> now that's funny. <laughs> that is funny. You know what I think? There's a gateway drug. You know how you've you've experimented with man love in the past. Mm-hmm. I, I think my experiment that I never realized that I was mm-hmm. outing myself was when when I make a little giggle. I'm, I make an unconscious little giggle. I make a he 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 sound, and I realize mm-hmm. that that's exact. And then I found myself doing stuff like this, and like hitting a coffee cup with a pencil. It's a nice pencil, but right. it, that, that's just not the same as. No, hello. That means, Bing. welcome, you have arrived. This yeah, just now, got where it needs to be. Now, does that mean that you're not going to giggle anymore? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a good mood. I just ate a burrito really, really fast. Oh, um, yeah. I, ha- I, You know, I've, I've eaten my usual breakfast of two chocolate chip cookies and a half a cup of coffee. The big, big cookies? Uh, no, not big ones. Normal, normal cookie-sized cookies. Now, what's normal for you? Well, let's see. A, a are, they, proper, are they Bromdenagian cookies? A proper cookie. <laughs> <laughs> a proper cookie, I think, should be the size of a dollar pancake. Oh, I would say that is that is a 1X standard size cookie. You're talking about like a little bigger than a Chips Ahoy? Well, no. A Chips Ahoy is a They've gotten small, cookie. John. I, 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 it, I it, to... It's terrible. A Chips Ahoy is like the size of, a, of John Lennon's uh, eyeglasses lens. Hmm. You're talking about like like the era like sixty six. Yeah, sixty six. Yeah. lens. And, and you know, I, I hate to admit that I've had these, but you know, sometimes when you're traveling and you got to eat out of machines, which is the worst, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'll find myself you, as it was when as you do, you find yourself eating cookies out of a machine, and I'm always like, what? You find the yourself fuck? living in a shotgun shack. Yeah, you find yourself living. And did you just make a, a Talking Heads joke? I'm afraid so. My other program had a reference <laughs> to that. This is getting really weird. I'm oh, gonna, my I'm God. Not gonna, I'm not going to hit the bell. I don't want to talk about your other program. You know what you need is productivity. Let's, let's circle back. Your problem, is, your problem is your productivity. <laughs> you don't, you're not doing what you love. My, pro, my problem is my productivity hmm. slash, no, semicolon, I'm not doing what I love. <laughs> That's your problem. That's that your problem. my problem. Now, do you remember, uh, what was it called? Was it called Cookie Crunch? And it was, it was, oh, yeah. I, I like to think of it as at least during my awareness of the phenomenon, I, I like to think of that as the apex of, of what I will call really cereal. Oh my God. My, my cereal was Cocoa Pebbles. Oh my God. Those were, those were, there were so many Cocoa Pebbles you could fit in a bowl. Oh, Cocoa right. Pe- if you were doing, even, even if you were doing a Captain, a, Cr- a Captain Crunch. You know, that's there's still there's a lot of holes in the yeah, captain. Yeah, that's exactly right. But a, but 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 cocoa puffs. It was like chunks of sugar. Or, I'm sorry, it, co- it, cocoa puffs. Yeah, was not my cereal. And a lot of times, people would get cocoa puffs. Yes, like if I was staying over at a friend's house or whatever, they're like, "What kind of cereal do you want?" I'm like, "Cocoa Pebbles." And well, then, right, right. That's like asking somebody for a Dr Pepper, and they give you like like a Sergeant Cumin, you know, <laughs> yeah, like from from from, 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 the, from the cash and carry. Oh, those are the worst. <laughs> but yeah, so the, then I then there'd be cocoa puffs, and they're like, "I got you what you wanted." And I'm like, "That's a cocoa puff. That's not a cocoa pebble." It, 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 you know, it's it's like chunks of sugar, and it's like gravy train. Remember that for dogs? We we pour hot water on it. It makes oh, gravy it makes for your this, dog. It's the it chocolate ma- milk. Chocolate soup. milk. Yeah. But co- you know, cocoa pebbles. First of all, uh, it had. Uh, 
the on the box was Bam Bam Bam, Bam, Bam Flint, yeah. Flintstones. Love Bam Bam. But it was just it was just basically a, a, a puffed rice soaked in chocolate until it could hold no more chocolate. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! I now that I'm talking about it, you know they don't make it anymore. I never see it. Are you kidding me? What Do is make- it because of the decline of the Flintstones, or is it the sugar must issue? Be, must be. That's a, that's a god. That's a goddamn shame. I, I I hate when breakfast foods go away. It makes me so angry. You want to know the weirdest thing? Yeah. This is the third Flintstones reference in the last twenty four hours in your life. Yeah, and the first two Flintstones references were both references to Anne Margaret's character oh my on the Flintstones. God, why did you say that? You know what I'm saying? Why? Her Mar- head was so big. Oh, it Remember was. how big well, her head and her hair you know, were? You know, her hair was the biggest of all hair. It was the large... Anne Margaret in the late 70s, early 80s, it was, there was no bigger hair. None, God, no, I, I, want, or, I want to get lost. I want to lose my compass and fucking get lost in that hair. Mm. You couldn't get... You know how hard it would be to get your hand out of that hair? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if you if you were really if you kind of lost yourself for a minute and you really got in there, you you would have to chew your arm off, but you wouldn't. She'd chew your arm off because she probably had a gig. But oh my God, Anne Margaret, Anne Margaret, that opening. I've never seen Bye Bye Birdie, but I've watched the opening credit thing a, a lot. Well, Anne Margaret in in Tommy. Oh yeah, perhaps the hottest of all things. Is that right? Okay, I'm gonna check that out. Yeah, I was. Have you, you not know, watched Tommy recently? No, I I was as you know, like I think like you. Yes, I know like you. Mm-hmm. I, I had a eh, it's from that weird phase in tenth grade where I was really transitioning and like a lot of very very different. Well, by by white you know middle class suburban standards, really really different weird rock music. I mean, mm-hmm. I like Black Sabbath. And the Who, and I was starting to get into like like the Fix. Like I still, I really liked was starting to like you know New Wave and Split Ends. Sure, the Fix was amazing. They were they're underrated, not as underrated as Missing Persons, but definitely up there. Mm-hmm. Agreed but, on both but counts. I was so my friend and I used to wear knee pads to school so that we could <laughs> slide slide down the hallways on our knees like Pete Townsend. You're, you're just lobbing softballs at me. Is that what they are? <laughs> <laughs> I had a members only jacket where I'd oh, undone stop. the epaulets because yeah. I'd once seen a picture of of an epaulet unattached Pete Townsend. But you know, and back then that's when he was still trying to make his hair do something. If well, you but look- the thing is, that Pete Townsend in the eighties was like thirty five. He was still like <laughs> totally young guy, still trying to like get hip with the times. And but the- he looked a little. It was like somebody shot uh, a very young marmot out of a cannon, and it happened to land on his head, and then he played guitar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it was sort of a flock of seagulls, but punk. Earlier. Well, you know, I think it's hard was there, you know, you remember when everybody had their salvos to make, like make a disco record I, and, and there's, this is very well documented. There's tons of bands that then felt the need to respond to new wave and including you got your Billy Joel's, you know, you got all these oh, people don't even say Billy Joel. You, you tell me don't glass I, houses was not his attempt to do a no, white album. I, I can't have, I can't talk about Billy Joel. I'm sure I put that on the card. I despise Billy Joel with such an uh, with such a, a white hot fury. I don't understand this. Is it on a molecular level? Yes, absolutely. Everything about him, every word, every syllable, every his his puffy face, his yeah. dumb, you know, East Coast working man horse shit. I just uh, none of it. I don't I, like I, it. Can, can I tell you the truth? Here, here, here's I, I hope I can tell you the truth because here's the one thing I don't have that problem with Billy Joel like I have with Phil Collins. <laughs> Phil, oh my God, Phil Collins is a saint. He he was good in Genesis, and then so now is amazing. Guess what? There's a third <laughs> card now. We got a third card. You know what? You know what always got me is as I got a little bit older, and I started I started to understand that like pictures of pretty ladies in magazines, somebody had like lit them to make them look good. Not that they didn't look good, and then I started to realize that every time you saw a professional photograph of something, like a lot of trouble had gone into it. And I don't know if it's Fifty Second Street or one of them, but I, I hate the fucking loose tie. The loose tie uh, loose in a pose tie. photo is yeah. it's so douchey. Well, I mean, no, wait, no, it's no, an no. overused the word. Loose, but... The loose skinny tie. Knit. The skinny knit loose tie. The skinny knit loose tie. Bad, 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 bad. Now, yeah. if you have a, if you're wearing a, a like a, like a, like a, an adult man's tie, yeah, and it's and you've loosened it because you're really getting you're really getting down to the knit tee gritty. Yeah. If you need to loosen your tie. That's one thing. But yeah, like getting dressed in the morning and putting your tie on oh, pre, pre loose. Oh man, that, that's a paddling. I, I and, yeah, and, I totally agree. Totally. And you know what that is? That's a Billy Joel move right oh, there. It's a totally fucking Billy Joel move. And yeah. then he's like standing outside the is he, is he holding a trumpet? 
I'm trying to remember. I, I think he might be holding an instrument. I might have been a cello. But he, he's out there. He just, oh, don't mind me. I'm just standing here on the streets of New York with my fucking tie. Yeah, and you know what? He's probably got uh. his. Uh, he's probably got the the sleeves of his suit jacket. You know, like pushed up his <laughs> pushed arm. Pushed up. That's he's... my second least favorite sleeve Uh-oh. trick. I, I I accidentally did this yesterday. I I hate the folding up. You know who looks good in this? Exactly one person. John Hamm on Mad Men looks good with this. Everybody else, you, you look like the biggest cock in the world. You, you got your sweater. You got your long sleeve shirt. You unbutton the buttons of your long sleeve shirt. I can't see what I'm doing because I have that combo right now. And I'm folding up the sleeve, starting with the cuffs. I'm folding. Oh, my God. I already fucking hate myself. You're doing it over the sweater. Over the sweater. And then you make it look real tidy. Hmm. And, yeah. But you think John Hamm can pull that off? Well, you should see he's a very slender man. He's a handsome guy. He's he's not, really, not, I wouldn't say slender. He's a powerfully built human. He's kind of like my TV Clooney. I really like that guy. He's a, you know, and you know what? He's a nice guy, too. Well, I know he's very, very funny. The, the Zach Galifianakis between two fern things, some of the things that he's done, the self-effacing things that he's, he's done, mm-hmm. makes me understand that if I were more handsome, I would be able to be a lot more funny and adaptive. Is that, yes. That's an excuse. I'm making an excuse, aren't I? Well, I mean, it's a thing, I think, where he feels, uh, now I'm not going to speak here for John Hamm. No. But I imagine, uh, 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 based on my encounters with him. What? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> uh, you know, if, you, if you go look up, the play, if you go uh, get the Playboy interview with John Hamm. Yeah. In the opening paragraph, the writer says, I'm interviewing John Hamm. And uh, John Roderick and uh, John Hodgman and Amy Mann are sitting across from us. It's, and uh, and they come over and there's they don't a lot even of, they don't even publish Playboy anymore. That is there's made a lot up. of badinage. I, I, I swear to you, you're you're mentioned in something in fucking Playboy That's where right. somebody's in a room with John Hamm and you were near him. That's right. I know. I, you know what? I'm going to come right out and say it. I know John Hamm. Hmm. Not in the biblical sense, because you're not a religious man. That's right. Not in the biblical Did sense. Did you shake I, his hand? I I'm saying that I know him. Does he have a relaxed sense of humor? He does, and uh, here, here's what I'm here's what I'm saying. I'm not speaking for him, but I imagine from yeah. interacting with him yeah. that his handsomeness is somewhat of a burden for him in pursuing what he truly loves, which is uh, comedy. I know he's, that's has crazy. A, he has a gift. I don't. Well, he wasn't like officially like a groundling or something, was he? But he does lots of no. stuff with comedy groups, and he he fits right in. And yeah, he likes it. He's a fan of it. He, did, did you, I'm sorry to talk about comedy, but, but if, he, ever, if he was an uglier guy, yes. he would be a better comedian. Oh, you're saying like if he was a Eugene, what was his name Eugene Merman or a Patton Oswalt? If he hey, was actually now, a, those guys are handsome guys. Well, they're, they're Tolkien characters, is the thing. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I would like to talk more about this, but it would just get super weird. Well, let's and, circle back to it. Well, okay. What was the other thing we're going to circle back to? Okay, so I got Triumph, Kiss, Phil Collins, and Billy Joel. Phil, Phil Collins. I'm gonna, I'm gonna even go. I'm going to go so far as to say No Jacket Required is a classic album. Do you want me to make more cards? <laughs> you make as many cards as you want. You make two, you make two cards, one that says Phil, the other says Collins. You understand, I'm the one that puts this on the internet. I've got the, I've got the, the rudimentary editing tools. I understand. Phil Collins is required. <laughs> Jerk, Billy Joel, hi. I'm John Roderick. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so we're now, talking ex- about John. I want to talk about, can we circle back to John Hamm? Yeah, sure. And that's what two M's. I'm going to put him in a different pile. You've okay. probably struggled with this, John. You're very good looking. You're very charismatic. And oh, I have to imagine at times you say, you say, stop, ter- stop staring at my tits and listen to my song about the space shuttle. <laughs> Do you encounter problems where you have trouble keeping people's focus on, on, on the way you help them? Uh, I think that my uh, inner ugliness uh, suffices. Oh, to- you're, like, you're like the emperor. The more you use that dark side of the force, the more wrinkled you get. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, or the more wrinkled the portrait of me in my attic gets. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I think a lot of people misunderstand that analogy. Yeah, I think, you know, I walk around, uh, I walk around uh, unconscious for the most part. <laughs> that was the 90s, right? <laughs> and so uh, I'm not aware of people really, uh, like, uh, undressing me with their eyes. That's how you know you're truly handsome, right? Mm. When you're Elle McPherson and you can just, you can just go uh, wear some, some, uh, uh, some sweatpants that say juicy on the back and, and, you, and you, you go to the store Ooh. and you buy some snuff. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine how hot that would be if she did some Copenhagen? There's, there's just Elle McPherson in some juicy sweatpants and uh, just her hair in a bun. Yes. Buying some Copenhagen. <laughs> and you know the best part would be I bet she could spit really well because most girls can't spit. Have you ever noticed that? Oh, have I ever noticed it? I have. Yeah. I have I, there was a while there in the 80s where I, I ran up like a, a, 
a clinic teaching girls how to spit. It's it's useless though. No, no, no. I mean, you can you, if you if you if you walk them all the way through the process. Like, here's what you're trying to accomplish. You're not. It's not a thing where it's not doesn't happen from the lips. It happens from the back of the tongue. It starts in a deeper place. Yeah, and you're trying to. What you're trying to do is you're trying to launch this goober. Mm-hmm. At, you know, with the idea that it, it that it has a life of its own now. It's mm-hmm. not. You're not just sending air out with some. It's not wet air. No, if you love your loogie, you got to set it free. Yeah, that's right. You're not. It's not just a spray of wet air. You are trying to create a new thing. Oh, it's it like it's almost like giving birth. Can, can I risk going a little bit ping pong for a minute? One mm-hmm. one problem. Uh, I'll let you continue, but I, I think one problem with with people learning to throw, especially girls, mm-hmm. is they don't understand when to let go of the ball. Ah, right. So, I mean, I, that I is never, a problem with girls. I was not geometric uh, in my studies, but I think that around the 45 degree angle, you want to let go because if you let go too early, it goes up in the air. You get to too late. It goes down. There's a whole lot of ways. I think with a loogie, you need to be thick of 45. And, 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 and on top of that, I think you're straight on to the point, which is that they don't really want to spit. And if you don't really want to spit, you're never going to get any good trajectory. You That's have right. to own that. Get behind that shit. Push. Well, this was the thing about my loogie clinic. Was that uh, the girls that the signed up for it all <laughs> r- truly did want to spit? It you wasn't know? just to be with you. It wasn't a thing where we're standing around a campfire and the girls like, Pleh! and I go, "Hey, <laughs> let me help you out." <laughs> it's a thing where they would contact me and they would say, "I understand that you can teach girls to spit," <laughs> and I would say, "Yeah, if you are ready." Uh huh. Was this would- like a, like a night class at a, like a community college? Well, it was it was Alaska, so it was uh, the Midnight <sighs> Sun. So there's no, there's no night. Oh, right. technically no night. Settle it would be, people, settle people. It would be what you would call night here in the in America, but in Alaska, <laughs> it's like the the sun is in the sky. You sound like a Native American in a commercial. <laughs> Midnight, which you call dark. That's ping My pong. people call it maze. I think the first thing, you have, first step zero, pong. you have to teach them that the loogie is not going to be part of you anymore. As you say, I think yeah. you want to let them know about wanting it. You know, it's like pushing out a baby. You need to move on with your life. You want to let the loogie go. But the very first thing, like rudimentary, is like how not to spit on yourself. Mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's like well, judo. And the and the mistake that people make is that they think that spitting involves pursing the lips. Mm. I think your baby analogy is perfect. Mm-hmm. When you're, give, you're giving birth to a baby, you don't purse the lips. No, opposite effect. No, no, no. You want to open and let the baby be free. And the lips, uh, the, your mouth lips are the same. Right. You want to create a loogie shaped hole in your mouth, a loogie shaped mm. ap, uh, you know, a- a- aperture, ap- aperture mm-hmm. and then uh, let the loogie, uh, l- then let the loogie like. The uh, fighter in the original Battlestar Galactica let that loogie make its way down the launch. It's a lot like tunnel. a baby, John. The more I think about it, the more I'm realizing. And, you know, it's sort of like when you get a thing where you go, it's kind of like a Braxton Hicks contraction. You know something's coming. Mm-hmm. And then you got to start getting ready. And like singing, like I don't know how to sing. And, and, but I know that when you learn how to sing, you learn that it doesn't come out of your mouth. It doesn't come out of your throat. It comes from somewhere much deeper. And I, if I understand correctly, you're saying in the sense that it is like having a baby, it has to start much earlier and in a different place. Exactly. And I, and I, I really feel like the, uh, I mean, uh, when my baby was being born, I was there in the hospital and I was saying, good for you. Battlestar Galactica launch sequence, <laughs> Battlestar Galactica launch sequence. <laughs> and it really helped everybody. And the doctor just turns to you and very quietly says, I work alone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know what women who are having a baby love is advice. Oh, wow. Don't they? Well, and the thing is, I, I mean, uh, if there was ever a time when a woman needs advice from a man, <laughs> it's when she's having a baby. Quit acting like such a faggot. Just have a baby. That's, that's what guys are for, right? We're there yeah. to provide some hard won advice. Right. Well, and you know, and the thing is, as as always, John, if I could say, you're giving the gift of context. You help. You're helping people understand. I don't want to say what's wrong with them, but in some sense, you're helping them understand what's wrong with them in terms of what they're not doing correctly. Because you have perspective that if you were pregnant and having a baby, you might not even have as much perspective. That might that might that might poison your well. If that's I could exactly say. right, you're too close to it. You're the too thing, close the, to it. The problem with a pregnant woman is that she has a baby in her. Right. Huh. Yeah. And hmm. yeah. that this is the problem, and we oh. need to resolve this problem. Yes. Get the baby out. Hmm. Right. F- fast, fastest way you can. Yeah. And from the p- perspective of a pregnant woman, that might not be ent- entirely obvious. I mean, obviously, she wants to get the baby out, mm-hmm. but she doesn't see how simple. What a simple one to one like. She problem. says she wants to get the baby out, but she right. probably likes getting a seat on the bus. See. 
See, mm-hmm. now you're getting close. Now you're getting closer. What do you she, think about what do you think about those stories of ladies who don't find out they're pregnant until a baby comes out? Doesn't that seem a little hard to believe? Have you heard these stories? Yeah, I have. Lady gets a little heavy, doesn't have a period for eight months, and then she goes, "What?" I, in my in my life, I have learned that no story involving a woman is too far fetched. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <sighs> Anyway, so that's terrible. we're just we're losing we're shedding listeners now. If only we could, John. That's the problem. We I don't know if it's a problem. It's a, it's an opportunity to stake. Mm, um, yeah, the cereal. Now, I, I I the cereal thing. I I keep thinking I'm gonna like it. I just don't like that kind of sugar as much as I used to. I will have a cookie sometimes, right. but I, I first of all, I'm not. To be honest, I'm not. Oh, I remember what I want to circle back to. I'm gonna write this down. Mm. Coffee. Um, I can't eat a lot of sweet stuff in the morning. And, and to begin with, as you know from, from our experiences with dim sum, I'm a savory man. Yeah, I, yeah, me too. I'd eat, I'd eat a steak every morning if I could. It would smoke yeah. up the house. But I would I would eat a – like before my family rose, I will have eaten a ribeye. That's like my dream. My, my thing too, I will I will eat spicy pork for breakfast all the time if Ugh. if I can get it. And, and, and I hate the normal breakfasts. Like I do not like French toast. Mm-hmm. I do not like most of the kind of sugar sweet breakfast things. But I also don't like to wake up in the morning and start making dim sum right away. You know, that's what I mean? a lot of work. You got to get dough. Yeah, I mean the dough. So to me and is the cookies just... are lying around. Yes, and I just I need a little. I need something. I need something to to cut the coffee. So I eat a couple cookies. Well, John, I, I got to tell you, I, I run into this problem constantly, and it's why. Just in the few minutes we had, we had a uh, we we agreed as we like we, we I think we have a, a, a pattern we're settling into, which mm. is to agree on a time to do the podcast, and then we alternately add fifteen minutes to it for two hours, and I think yeah. it's working for both of us, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We say okay, eleven o'clock, and then you go eleven fifteen, 15 yeah. and then I go let's say eleven thirty, and, and I get then... happy. I get happier every time we <laughs> delay it because it's just <laughs> sometimes it'll be two o'clock in the afternoon. We're still like fifteen more minutes. It's like working your urethra. Yeah. And, and so my problem is my neighborhood is full of food. Well, I think one thing you're getting at also the breakfast what that you're just, you, descri- what are, you yeah. thought you were going to just slip that by me? Well, not while you're sober, <laughs> but the, um, <laughs> ding. <laughs> <laughs> See, you know, it's, it's like a poop joke. As I'm telling my daughter, you gotta, you gotta keep the poop jokes dry. Cause yeah. if you do them too much, you know, then you're just like the guy who does the poop joke. And I don't want to become bell guy. No, no, no. You don't want to do bell guy and you don't want to be the poop. The thing about the bell is you have to forget the bell's there. Oh, I see. And, it's like meditation. Yeah, you forget the bell is there and then you say something and you're like, God, I wish I had a bell. Holy shit, I have a bell. Okay, I'm, I'm moving it. I'm moving it four inches to the right and slightly out of my field of vision. I'm going to put it behind this thing of uh, home cleanser. <clears throat> um, it's, like, it's like a headlamp, for instance. I have I, I, I have a variety of headlamps around the <laughs> house. Uh, and... <laughs> They aren't all collected on one shelf. No, you no, got no, them around no. in case the lights go out. Is that the right. idea? If, if the lights go out, and the thing is, if, if, if you hang them on doorknobs, if you hang light, uh, headlamps on doorknobs around your house, you forget they're there. But then the lights go you, out. Well, you just stop seeing them, so to speak. Exactly. The lights go out. You reach for a doorknob. There's a headlamp. Hmm. It was so, like, it's like light switches. You don't have one light switch for your house. Right. You need a little. You need a little help all the time. You never know. Now, what about what about weapons? Do you have weapons? You know what? We shouldn't get into it. I bet you've got weapons. You got your vault, but then you got them in different places too, right? Here's the thing: if okay. the Navy SEALs or or an associated group decide to cut the power to my house in advance of coming in through the <laughs> your, windows, your underwater house, no matter where I am, no matter where I am at that moment, I'm going to have access to a headlamp. <laughs> A defensive weapon, a and source, some, a source and of cookies. fire. <laughs> I got two cookies, a headlamp, and a Glock. <laughs> now, do, do you do you, do you do that thing where you, you hit the floor and roll? Now, man, you your age, you're gonna need. You should probably warm up. You should warm up before you do that. You definitely hit the floor, but you also have to look around your house and see. And this is something I recommend to everybody. Yeah, look around your house and see where the the defensive positions are, like where. <laughs> Where are the corners that you're going to? Where are the corners where you're going to get trapped, and where are the corners where you're going to be able to make a stand? Right. You you, you want a place where you can fit the barrel of a rifle through it, but you want it to, don't want it to be so big that people can see your scope. Yeah. Right. You, I mean, you want to be able you want to you want to be able to to defend the position, and so you want to be on right. I'm guessing high ground. Now, do you do that thing like they do in Beretta, where you knock all the glass out of the window and make it a circle with the gun? No. 
Is that a rookie thing? Is that a rookie thing? <laughs> that's dumb. You're, you're, that, that's like some kind of, that's like a, a 30s gangster thing where you're like trying to hold the cops off or something or, or a cowboy thing. Well, without, no, res- no, no. without respect, are you saying that all 30s gangsters things are, are ineffective? No, I think, uh, you know, frankly, <clears throat> uh, if, I, if I were going around the world on a yacht... <laughs> Super yacht. If I not a super yacht, if I was going around the world on <laughs> a my standard, on, a standard yacht. yacht. Well, no. I, here's the thing about a yacht. Did you know that that uh, that that John Wayne recommissioned a navy like destroyer as a as a as his personal yacht? I did not, and that is fucking awesome. He he got a he got a like a, a it was like it was a minesweeper or something like a navy warship and he had it remade as his yacht and the thing the thing about going around the world on a yacht if you're going to do such a thing is that the smart move is to not have it look like a fancy yacht mm-hmm. camouflage it as a ocean going tugboat hmm. Hmm. and then you can go to these places uh, like the Strait of Malacca <laughs> where where pirates rule. And uh, they do not think that you are Paul Allen in a, in the octopus. <laughs> they think that you are just a seafaring sea tug. If you're, if you're on like if your wheelhouse is on like the fourth floor of the boat and you're dressed up like Commodore Schmidlap, that's going to send a signal. If you've got a beard and it's, there's literally stock options all over the boat, right? Yeah, you're in trouble. But that's going to arouse the interest of a pirate. If I were going around the world, say for instance, on my ocean going sea tug, <laughs> that is actually a yacht. <laughs> disguised as a as a sea tug i would definitely have some 1930s style thompson 45 caliber submachine guns and that's the one we put the little disc of bullets on it it looks like it looks like a film canister exactly and here's why because that is that gun internationally communicates that you are, are a gangster that gun says that you mean business. More than an M16, more than an AK47. If you have a Thompson submachine gun, let's say you're on your sea tug and you're going through the Straits of Malacca and some pirates start assaulting your yacht. Right? <laughs> Here come the pirates and you're driving through the night. You see them on the radar. <laughs> and they're they they don't have any lights on their boats and they're coming they're coming at you. They're going to they're going to jump on your boat and they're going to take it over. And then you just Boom! You put on all the spotlights, and you and your and your crew are standing on the back of your boat with Thompson submachine guns. And you're all wearing zoot suits and, and fedoras. No pirate would ever make a stab at that. You just point. see the outline mm-hmm. of a Thompson 45 caliber submachine gun. You, you, all you need to see is the shadow of that, and you know business is meant. That's right. You're like, oh. Oh, right. we're messing if, if with you've the got wrong sea tug. You got a forty-five or something. They're going to go. Wow, that's going to be a big gun that goes pop. But you right. see somebody with one of those things with the film canister on it. You're you're going to really rethink the whole piracy situation. That's you're going to exactly. leave Mal- Mal- Malacca. Is that what it's called? No, the Straits of Malacca. Straits of Malacca. Okay. Are those hard to navigate in a in a seagoing tug? Uh, no, 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 no. They're quite easy to uh, to navigate. But uh, but it's um, it's a uh, it, it it's one of these places in the world where all the boats have to go because it's the um, it's the only way through. It's like the right? DM, it's like the DMV. It's like you you leave Singapore and you have to go through this you have to go through this narrow strait on your way to the Indian Ocean and it's kind of, it's it's like the Panama Canal except it's a natural uh, waterway. Oh, it's like uh, it's like the Golden Gate. It's like this is the only way through. Exactly. Kind of okay. Exactly. So all the boats have to go through this place and the pirates that live the Indonesian pirates or the Malaysian pirates. I think they're probably Malaysians. Okay, good. I, I would I would want to impugn the wrong group. Well, wait a minute. They might be Indonesians too. In fact, I bet you there are Indonesian and Malaysian pirates working. They've together. outsourced a lot of that to Bangalore now. But but they uh, they wait there in the night and you you run your boat through there and then they and you are you are to use a uh, a landlubber term like a sitting duck. Well, if you are not if you are not uh, uh, ever vigilant, okay. There are great there are some great stories of people in big big boats where where they're looking at the you know they're watching their radar and they see that this flotilla of pirate, uh, you know, like this ragtag fugitive fleet of pirate boats are coming out of the night and they see them on the radar and they like gun it and the pirates chase them. And it's like, you can't see the pirate ships because they're they're, uh, they're It's all dark, but they're running from these little dots on their radar screen. And sometimes they, sometimes they outrun the pirates. Sometimes they don't. 
Would you want like some kind of Roy Scheider, uh, Roy Scheider style, like like depth? Are they called depth charges? Would you want to have some kind of boat bombs that you could you could leave behind as a little present for those guys? Is that is that, is that even a good defensive tactic? Because if you you can assume no. they're going to make a straight line toward your boat. Could, could yeah, you... I, I think I think that you, there, there's there's too great a risk that you're putting depth charges out there. You're putting mines in the water, and the pirates are going to miss them, and then the next person. You know, then it's like a boat full of orphans comes along and hits the mines. Yeah. For me personally, since I th- I thrill to the uh, to the battle, I would I, I think the Thompson submachine guns and then maybe a box of grenades. Oh, that gives you flexibility. Right. And you're and, and, and you you're a man who, if I could say, you're a man who prefers personal warfare. You don't like this pussy shit of hitting people with a screen. Yeah. You like the idea of seeing of seeing the grenade literally blow them apart. Right, so as the boat comes, because they're the thing about a pirate is he ha- his boat has to touch your boat at some point. Right, right. The pirate getting ten feet from your boat is no good for a pirate. Mm-hmm. He has to get his boat touching your boat so he can make the leap. Right. Yes. And at that point, if you're hiding over the gunwale with your Thompson submachine gun and you lob a grenade into his boat, you can you can throw a grenade ten feet. Mm-hmm. And he's ten feet away, and he's like, "Only ten more feet!" And you're like, "Ha ha! Grenade! Boom!" Right. And then, ha! Huh, that now tell me that that isn't preferable to like, oh, I'm throwing a mine in the water, and oh, boom. Well, worst of all, you may not know if you even hit your target, let alone the orphans. Right. It could have been orphans. This is why I don't like modern fighter pilot technology. Exa- we, yes, absolutely. Because these guys are shooting missiles at planes over the horizon. They I think don't he might have get- said it was it was a pussy move, or, or well, you may have said another word, but it was something it's along a little bit of a pussy move. And I feel that way about uh, about drone drones. About drones that was too. drones. If I, you I, are going to kill somebody, I really feel like you have to be at least proximate to that person. It's just a, it's what a gentleman would do. That's exactly right. Okay, I have several questions here. I was going to ask you. I have a silly question. I'm not going to ask you. Hmm. Um, no, no, no. Why would you not ask me this other question? Uh, what, if every, what if all the pirates are clowns and they use the pirate cannons to shoot clowns on your boat? Because yeah. you can shoot a clown out of a cannon, right? See, pirates have cannons. A that's a really okay. silly question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all so, you'd have to do then is rig up netting around your boat, catch the clowns. Throw them in the <laughs> you just need defensive clowns. Yeah, you just you need, to, you, need some, you need circus netting and defensive clowns. Would you have a, would you have a big top on your tug? <laughs> what, you, what you do is you buy, you buy one You disguise mini your tug. You disguise your John Wayne <laughs> super yacht as, as a circus. Because everybody loves circuses. Who's going to attack a circus? They got no money. Mm. Who goes to the circus? Now, here's my other question. I have several questions. Yeah. Uh, did you say you're drinking coffee again? Yeah, I went back on coffee. Good. I mean, I assume good. How's, how's it working? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. All of, my, all of my friends who have learned not to be enablers about drugs to me who aren't like why don't you smoke dope why don't you do bath salts with me you could have a little beer yeah they're not, everybody's real good about that but god when i stopped drinking coffee it struck at the heart of every friend i have people were people were genuinely saying things to me like that's the stupidest thing i've ever heard you quit it's, it's like scientology they're saying you, you you know or the mob i guess more really more scientology but like you don't leave this what are you yeah. doing sit yeah, down yeah. Yeah, that's right that's right you don't leave this exactly <laughs> no, no. So I got back on coffee, and it, and it's great. I mean, it's a wonderful drug, and I I love it. I I, uh, I enjoy it. I'm trying to moderate it a little bit and not drink like thirty cups a day. But well, it's it's I'm the wrong person to make this kind of observation about you. But it seems like <clears throat> it had become something that you were doing a lot of. Mm-hmm. It's, it seemed like you, there was always a pot of coffee being made, and yeah. <laughs> I don't. I know. I mean, you know, I, I. This is not. This is not my job. It. You know, I just. I'm here to audit you. Basically, I want to find out what some of your weaknesses are and find out wh- how much money I can get out to put you on this uh, electronic <laughs> machine that doesn't actually do anything. <laughs> but but uh, you know, they got this. You go down the Muni. You go down the like Powell Street Station. I don't know how they're allowed to do this unless there's a conspiracy, which there probably is. Yeah. But you know, there's people down there, and it says uh, you see a sign. You get these, <laughs> tunnel people. The tunnel people. It says free stress test. You ever seen this? Oh my God! It's some. It's a Scientology thing, right? It's, a, it's totally a Scientology. You see them all. You see like four in a row. Yeah. You know they got those dead dark doll eyes, and and they're sitting there, and they got a, a really friendly looking sign that says "free stress test." Oh. You know, which is you know, it's it's like it's like an existential free estimate. Like no matter what, you're going to need some shit change. You're like, you know what? You're going to need a new timing belt. That's just going to happen. <laughs> Do you remember when there were Hare Krishnas in the airports? Very much. What happened to them? Uh, I can't speak for other airports. I can tell you where they are at our airport. Oh, there are they're still at your airport. Well, well that's San Francisco. No, what do you hear? Well, San Francisco. See, it would be if San Francisco was just fucked up in one way, we would be fine. 
Again, yeah. it's like these people. It's like it's like the bike bike guys running a stop sign. It's when four people do it that you get, you get a crash. Right. San Francisco is is fucked up in so many, uh, not paradox, contradictory ways. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I, I can't. Spe- I've only lived here for thirteen years. I can't begin to understand the stupid. But 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 <laughs> right. what I will tell you is this, and I, I'm kind of surprised you haven't seen this. You'll see this in definitely in Terminal Three in the United Terminal. You're yeah. walking around. You're everybody. I don't ticketing. fly United. That's why. Oh, good man. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back to that. Okay. I got like a lot to say about airlines. Don't, don't can I just beg you not to get me started on US Air? Okay. Oh my God, really? <clears throat> I'm flying US Air tomorrow. Oh my gosh. Don't tell me. I don't want to know about it. <clears throat> I, 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 have, I, about... I upgraded to first class once and it was like being in a portal with gum on the seats. <laughs> I'm flying not, not in a good way. I'm flying to New York. I'm flying from New York to Seattle or from Seattle to New York. I bought the ticket yesterday. Oh, I saw this on your internet. You it was like hundred and ninety bucks? <gasps> You, you know what, John? I, I don't. You're you've been you've been to college and stuff. You didn't finish, but you you should make sure that's a real ticket. You you might have you might have bought. Uh, I don't know. You might have bought that from like a magician or something. That sounds yeah. very inexpensive, John. My feeling about it though is that uh, having flown every airline, and I truly have, except I have not. I've, I have not flown uh, whatever the Sri Lankan airline is. But I've what flown about the Israeli the... one. You've been on the Israeli one? Oh God, I've always wanted to fly El Al. Yeah. But uh, but no, I never have. Okay. That's you know what? That's one of those vacations I want to take, where I just go to Israel and I walk. And you just around. want to see what if you can get away with like. I not- walk around in a robe and see who will follow me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'm not gonna do it. Not gonna hit it. But uh, but I figure <clears throat> all the all the domestic airlines, it's all shit now, right? I mean, uh, Jet JetBlue or Virgin, they're nice. They're nice. Oh, I, I think I think I think pound for pound, Virgin is as close as you're going to get to what it was like to fly in the good days. But it's still crap. It's still crap. Just the airport they're, experience alone. Yeah, and 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 you're flying Virgin Airlines, and they're pumping that Chris Cornell song with with uh, Doctor Dog or whatever the fuck song that is. <laughs> you know, they're they're pumping that like. <laughs> oh, right in the purple lighting. Yeah, I bet you hate the purple like, lighting. Stop doing that with the purple lights. <laughs> yeah. It, so anyway, it's a nightmare to get on an airplane now, and I'm just realizing, you know. That those little I was fooling myself for a long time. Like you know what? It's worth the fifty dollar upgrade to have two more inches of legroom. And now I'm realizing it's not. It's just hmm. it's it's just a shit barge. It's a shit barge full of of like long pigs. And <laughs> I just need to fucking. I just need to recognize it. It's like I'm going to spend eight hours with long pigs on a shit barge. <laughs> I want the cheapest ticket I can. Fuck well, you. What's a long pig? I, I remember the long pig mask. And I, I, is it is it a character? It's a it's a human being. Well, oh, that's good. I want to circle back to that. Um, <clears throat> airlines, which I just misspelled here. Here's the other thing, John. Is uh, you know somebody has a little experiment during all the TSA theater nonsense of the last few years. Somebody made a fake ticket and was able to get on a plane with it. Just just really? to show. Yeah, yeah. You can make you can make a fake boarding pass, and it's not that hard. What I'm saying is, a man like you, I think, knowing what you know, having been through what you've been through, having walked across Europe, spent a week stewing, and then and then gone to the was it North Face and, and to get satisfaction. <laughs> my thought is, if you got there when it was real busy, uh-huh. reg- I, you could walk up there with basically a dum dum sucker and try to convince them that that was a hundred ninety dollar ticket. I think you could demand <laughs> satisfaction to a level where they would not they would walk you through security and apologize like a gentleman. You know that my dad was my dad was great at that uh, uh, back in the day, but but I, I, it's just not it's just not worth interacting with it's just not worth interacting with the subnormals in that way. Yeah. I, when I when I walk into an airport, I put on a I put on a protective shield of of do not touch me, and I and I carry this protective do not touch me shield all the way to my final destination. I wish I had a two sizes smaller version of that suit for pretty much all the time. <laughs> I want to. I want to get some kind of a suit that's like I don't know. It sounds kind of kinky, but I would like a full body plastic suit that that has that slowly releases Purell over my entire body. <laughs> I, I want to be bathed in. Pur- I want to be glistening with. I want to be like a dog's nose. I want to walk places I never want to touch anything, including myself, because I'm a carrier. I'm a carrier now. I've been on. I, do you have any? You know what? This is boring. You're drinking coffee again. It's working out okay. Yeah. And if and, I had a superpower, yeah. I, my this, is a, this, is a, this is a big one, John. This is a, that, you're getting into a heavy Hodgman S topic here. This is a big one. My superpower. I have I've put long. I've put a lot of thought into this. Really? My super. Yes. My because you know I've spent a lot of time with Hodgman, and this is the type of question that he asks. Whether you want to have, have the conversation or not, it might, it might go on until five in the morning. In my experience, <clears throat> you must understand, John. My su- my superpower, <laughs> I think, would be the power to rust. <laughs> God damn it. 
<laughs> okay. Your if superpower you, would be the power to rust. If you could just point your finger at something and make it something metal and make oh, it rust. Oh, make other things rust. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't personally want to rust. Are you impervious I, to it? Well, yeah, there's no part of me that can rust. Okay. The, the, the metal, the metallic parts of me are made of stainless steel. Okay. It's, it's, it, like, it's it, like the Midas touch, except you've been driving in Massachusetts all winter. Right. Exactly. Okay. It's like, it's like salt on the roads, but like, say somebody points a gun at you, you point your finger at it and it rusts. Oh, that's pretty good. You can, I mean, if you, if you have the power to rust on command at a distance too, you could rule the world. Well, and I, I, I for, forgive me because I've been spending literally every free moment for the last month reading X Men comics. But it seems to me that if you got that tuned highly enough, if you went, if you went to meet with Professor X and had some time in the Danger Room, you might be able to get to a point where you could work it like Cyclops. You don't want it just shooting out randomly, but you could get it so good. Now you got metal in your body. People got metal. You can't make carbon rust. I mean, Neil Young showed that. But you could. You, it seems to me that you could, if you could just excite the base metals in somebody's body you could fucking rust their insides just enough to get you get you where you could run away Ooh. think about it think about it you got we <clears throat> mercury eat fish you get mercury in you mm, you know yeah. what you, could, you know really what i take it back mercury. it doesn't make, it makes no sense you can only do <laughs> no, it cripp- only, only cripples only cripples so <laughs> anybody so if an old lady's bugging you you could fuck her hip up good but here's the thing i'm okay. not super worried about some person with their hands causing me damage i'm worried about them using a tool Right of some kind. You feel like in hand-to-hand combat, you can hold your own. Yeah, but if they have a tool, then it gives them an advantage. If I do not have a, 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 a comparable tool, tool. But if they, for instance, had a knife, mm-hmm. I would rust the knife. What, would, a pl- what about a plastic knife? See, and that's the thing. And this is what that, they're doing now. This is what the terrorists do. Yeah, plastic knives, wood knives. But I feel like if uh, up against somebody with a wood knife. I, I I feel like I could also improvise a little. I have a feeling that something would they would probably trip or something. I think anybody who goes into a, a fight with John Roderick with a wooden knife deserves whatever the fuck they get. Yeah, but if they're chasing me in a car, rust, or, oh, the car right. stops. Well, like, you know, if Iron Man, it wears down his power to use that. You know, kind, kind, you know same thing as, like, the Emperor, right? You, it wears you down a little bit. You need to rest. In this case, I would not even waste any of your rust powers on somebody with a wooden knife. I would just yeah. beat the shit out of him. You could beat the shit out of him, right? Yeah, right, because they're looking at me, they're thinking, how, is, how are you going to use your rust powers here, Mr. Guy? And mm-hmm. I'd be like, pow, right in the nose. Or you could just make him feel bad about himself. Yeah, that's true. Hey, what's up, wood knife? <laughs> <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice wood knife, wood knife. Uh, so I think, I, think rust, I think rusting, you know, because my eventual goal as a superhero is not to be part of a team of, uh, you know, of do-gooders. My eventual oh, goal right. as a superhero is to... Uh, you know, is to bring pre- peace to the world. I'm I one think of those, a lot of people start out that way, John. But then I'm they, a messianic they, p- superhero. A messianic one. So you put on a robe and people follow you. You're rust man. Are you rust man? Is that what's the name? Is well, it rust? I don't know. No, I'd have to come up with something. I'd have to come up with you know. I'd be well, so far. So far, I've got. I've got uh, I, I don't like any of these. But so far, I've got rust man. Yeah. I've got. I've got rusty. Right. I've, no, I, that's not good. I've got one. This sounds. This sounds like a, <laughs> like a kid's soccer team. Uh, the rust. You mean just the rust? The rust. I, what about I, what, just rust? Was it, is it iron? Not, what is it? What is what is rust? It's like oxidated metal. Yeah. Is it? Could you be the oxidator? I could be the uh, the oxidator. The oxidator. That's pretty good. I, I haven't thought about that a lot. Iron, I don't think, Iron Man I, would just be like poof, right? Um, I don't know. He has the repulsor hang, hands. He can like shoot repulsor beams at you. Iron Man's a pretty cool superhero. Yeah. He's, he's a, like a pretty high tech Batman in a lot of ways. You got to admire the guy. But but. But against the against the rustinator, rusty. <laughs> I think rusty. You would not want it to get around that you were rusty because I think no. you're going to be facing a lot of fucking wooden knives. That would be bad. Yeah. yeah could, could we add another thing though? Where you you would have yeah. maybe part of your. So if I could say, and again, forgive me because it's been all Marvel for me all the time. But yeah. what if you've got the rust power? Like you've been developing that. Maybe it was a, for a long time. It was a trouble for you. It was like mm-hmm. the Midas touch, mm-hmm. right? Because you could. Yeah, run. sure. I'd be like, hey, that's great. Let me. Pl- oh, let me play with your. Oh, sorry. Right. You, you kiss a girl with braces, and then she can't open her mouth. And you go, ah, you're like rogue. And you're like, ah, why am I killing all oh, these people? No, why am I rusting everything? But the other thing is maybe part of your rust ability is you also have an innate sense of maybe it's not just that you can't be surprised, but when you're aware of some, something threatening that could be rusted getting oh, near you. right. I sense that's the metal. To me, you sense the metal. To me, that's where this starts to really come together. And I've honed it. I've honed the power so that, like, for instance, I don't have to rust the whole gun. No. I can just rust 
I can I can rust the little spring on the inside of the gun that would cause it. Or to Or no you could function. rust the you could rust the muzzle just enough that it blow up in his fucking face. Yeah. See, selective rustology. Can, Se- I, can I also say just to bring it all together, the being in line, the TSA line, could be a lot of fun when you're the, oh. when you're rusty. You know, I'm sorry, so. we well, got to get you a better name. Right? Yeah, rusty's terrible. I don't I don't like rust man. I think that sounds too old. Yeah. Oxidator sounds like a bad guy. That's not good. It's got to be. And the thing about it is I think I would wear, I think I would dress like Tom Wolf. I'd wear a white <laughs> sleeping suit. <laughs> and, and then at the, at the end of every battle, you know, I would like fl- have to flick little bits of rust off of my, off of my coat. Which I'd you- always be constantly, that'd be my, that'd be my, uh, my killer seal. I'd be constantly trying to keep my jacket white. Okay, so because there has to be something. If I, and I, if I could just say again, this is your gig. I would avoid DC. I would go Marvel because that's where the flawed people go. With all respect, but oh, yeah. also you, you got it helps if you have some kind of a like a uh, like, I don't say a gimmick, but you got like a, for example, um, Captain America has a shield. Yeah. Thor ha- has a hammer. Right. Wolverine's got those cool claws. Like I don't know if this would be part of your rust. Probably Daredevil, the blind guy's got that cane. Like it'd be kind of cool if you had something that was part. Maybe I don't know. I don't know if it's even interesting to you, but something that you could use in the service of your of your rusting abilities, hmm. or you know, or or they would just be handsome. Like a walking stick could be nice, or maybe a crop. Well, a you, know, you could have a monocle. I've always been partial to sword canes, <laughs> but the problem with the sword cane, of course, is that I'm the rustinator or whatever the rust 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 of rustafarian. Oh, oh no. No. Why did you say it? That changes uh, uh, everything. The Rustafarian, he has, he has dreadlocks, man. Rustafarian. No. Uh, God, no. That's uh, it's going away. Rustafarian. So the coffee's okay, though. You just have enough. You don't... I, I mean, I don't want to judge. I'm not trying to judge. You know, I never judge you. I, that would be the very bad. I don't, 6 p.m., I can't be drink. I can't be making another pot. Oh, it's so important. I, John, as I get older, you talk about... First of all, I can also say the second that you mentioned, was it spicy pork? Mm-hmm. You put the word spicy in front of any food, and I'm back in Vancouver after I had some spicy tuna and went to a Sloan show. Oh. I did not get to see a lot of the Sloan show. Oh, because the spicy tuna caused you to have a have a uh, you you had to do a dad boner in the men's room. A, da- a dad boner? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, Can- in Canada, they call it uh, explosive diarrhea. Yeah. But it was, and the thing is, in Canada, they love their bathrooms. They wear a lot of jean jackets. You ever know how many people wear jean jackets? Well, the thing about Canada, yeah. Is that Canada in some ways it's still nineteen eighty seven in Canada. You just blew my mind. Right? Yeah, Am you I know right? what? I, I, I didn't have I didn't have a way to put my finger on it, but it's yeah. it's it's there's still it's still uh everybody's still wang chunging tonight. That's right. It is it is like I think I've told you this before, but I feel like Canada is like the original twenty one jump street. <laughs> like everybody everybody's kinda hip, kinda groovy, mm-hmm. but in a way in a kind of in 1987 way. So Canada is like a polite, uh, like pilot for the nineties. Yeah. Right. Okay. Exactly. Hmm. Like the gangs in Canada don't wear red and blue handkerchiefs. They wear green and yellow handkerchiefs. They know, they know what the hanky code is. They know. Well, they like, they don't want to, they want to be gangs, but they don't want to be like, Oh, they don't want to get the crips upset. Oh, so they, see, so that's... they came up with their own colors. They're like, we're if the you, green guy. I think if you have a checkered hanky in your back right pocket, it means you like to apologize. And if you have it in your left pocket, it means you like to be apologized too. Oh, I see. That's a Toronto <laughs> hanky code. I saw, the, I saw those guys open for Arcade Fire. They're pretty it's great. It's very complicated when you're trying to negotiate whether you're a top or a bottom, because not everybody is a top. And not I, think, a... I think Canada's a bottom. Well, you would think that, but there are some pretty tough characters in Canada. They're just tough, very tough, tough bottoms, about. yeah. <laughs> there are some pretty tough bottoms, some pretty resilient bottoms. You know, of, we, uh, we we kid, but I mean, I, boy, do I ever really like Canada, Canada and New Zealand. You know, I've only been to four countries, but but uh, the the really? two of them I like a lot are Canada and New Zealand. I hear I hear uh, New Zealand. They say New Zealand is like England in the fifties. Oh, you mean declining? <laughs> A simpler time. You know, England and U.S. were not on my list. England was fine. That's that's what the third country of the four I've been to. But, You've been to uh, New Zealand, England, Canada, and America. Let me think. <laughs> Let's see what is today. Yeah, four. I've been to four countries. Yeah. Huh. Well, that's some variation on the theme. Well, I I, re- I had reached a point in my life where I had some things to think about, so I took a very long walk. Mm-hmm. I took a very long walk from my office 
mm-hmm. uh, to the burrito place. And then when I got back, I, I, I tore the shit out of that goddamn North Face place. Yes. I said, are you kidding me? This fanny, pack, this fanny pack broke while I was waiting for my burrito. My burrito, my Bronco burrito was there. There used to be a time when you could depend on this. This is equipment that could save your life. That's right. That's right. I was depending on this equipment. Oh, God, I love that story That's what you so say. much. That's what you say. People was... remember that. People remember that story. John, I think you have taught a lot. Of, if I could say, it's your show. I think you have taught a lot of people, not simply how to demand satisfaction, but, but how important it is that you do demand yes. satisfaction. So you must demand satisfaction. Mm-hmm. People will walk all over you otherwise. I, I, I got a ticket the other day. Mm. I parked in a parking garage on a Sunday because I... Uh, because I I, I I get tickets periodically. Is it Sunday of a holiday weekend? Uh, you this get a wasn't, ticket. This was this yeah. This was this was this was a couple weeks ago. Okay. But I, I went to the. I was driving downtown and I was like, I'm going to be in this. I'm going to be in this rehearsal all afternoon, <clears throat> and uh, and I don't want to get a ticket. And I always uh, I always park on the street and then I get a ticket. So I'm gonna I'm gonna outsmart them this time. I'm going to park in a parking garage. <laughs> and it was only later that I realized it was Sunday and there was no parking. You know, there was no charge for parking. So. I, I was already, I was trying to outsmart them and I outsmarted myself. I paid $10 to park in a garage where there was, where, where I could have just parked in front, right in front of where I was going. But then I come out later on that night, there's a ticket on my windshield from the parking garage people. And I had paid the amount. And I looked at the ticket and I looked at the receipt that I had kept from the machine. And, and I was like, this is, this is, uh, uh, this is insane. Like I did the thing. They obviously don't know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So I took these things as you do to my mom. <laughs> and I said, can you make sense of this? And she said, I'm going to write them a strongly worded letter. <laughs> and she did. So she goes down to the Marcia cave. <laughs> she went down to her bat cave at where her butler said, <laughs> Welcome. How may I assist you? Her computer butler. And she sent a strongly worded letter to these people. And they wrote back, they, they wrote back the, like a three word response. They were like, ticket is canceled. And it was like, what? Well, yes, first of all. But second of all, how many people, first of all, have a mom who has a bad cave? How many people actually write the strongly worded letter? A small percentage. Yeah, and and these people are just like uh, they're blanket ticketing everybody, Ugh. and then uh, you know, and then you get into this collections process where you don't pay the thing, and then you owe them double, and then finally you pay it just to get them off your back. Uh, uh, what a what what a fucking racket, John! You need to demand satisfaction, and I'm trying to think of a way to demand satisfaction from these ticket people. But John, John, that what you got was an answer, but it's not a solution and it is far from satisfaction. That's right. I, you didn't, I you didn't get an, you didn't get an explanation. I think there should have been an explanation. There there definitely should have been an apology. There right. probably should have been some kind of a gift for you and your mom. This See, something, I, maybe something I, she could put in the cave. I would have accepted a gift. You like know, like a, like, a, like a small gift, like a personal gift or a token gift, like a pen. If they had sent like a selection of Keels, uh, oh, some, some, some nice creams, some creams, I would have accepted that. I Maybe think I would have free parking. Free parking would be nice. A card that gives me free parking. That would be mm-hmm. nice. There are a lot of gifts you could give. You should get to punch the guy who gave you the ticket. Not hard, but like you should, you should have the opportunity to confront your accuser. Yeah. Right. And exactly. you should, you should get to hear them. Maybe you get to hold them not hard, but like lightly by the collar. Cause I assume they have a uniform. They might even have a collar. These yes. guys, it might be on a budget. You pick him up, you hold him up in the air like you're fucking Batman and you get to have him give you in full sentences right. an apology that, that, that satisfies you. <laughs> yeah, I would. I, I, you know, I thought about that. I thought about like uh, wanting to stomp on this guy's toes, but then I realized that probably if I w- uh, if I were confronted by the guy that gave me the ticket, I would see right away that he was from Somalia, and I would look into his eyes and I would realize that he had seen war torn lands that he had been. You are such. Lived a thousand lives. You are such a sucker. You know who lives in Somalia? Hmm. If they're not dead, they're fucking warlords and pirates. Please and do not. Do not apologize just, for this guy, John. They're it's just like having that, a good time there. It's like that guy in Cleveland. It's like the Nazi in Cleveland. I don't, I, you know, just because you get old doesn't mean you weren't a Nazi. Domnyanyuk? <laughs> that's not, that that's, not, that's, not, that's not Citizen X, right? That's, uh, what was his name? Chikatilo. Chikatilo, I think, was his name. The guy who killed all the people in Russia. They think he might be the greatest serial killer of all time. We don't oh, even know. Oh, Chikatilo. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. There's an HBO show the guy, about him. The guy in the 80s. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the Nazi in Cleveland. And then he, uh, I think he died. Uh, they all die eventually. 
Yeah. I, I, I don't know, John. I got to say, I, you know, I don't like to talk too much about Hitler on here, but I'm going to say Nuremberg. You know, I, I think when you go in there and you do not pick up the Somali and buy his collar or not his collar and demand satisfaction, mm. I think you are tacitly, you are t- basically letting the brown shirts win. I see. So you're saying that that uh, that I should not let someone's uh, refugee status from a war torn uh, like a anarch a- anarchic African nation right. obviate. My need for satisfaction about uh, being ticketed improperly. Can I be honest with you? Yes. I don't want to talk about politics, but I do know this. I do know that at the time that you start overthinking this shit, you, John Roderick, as soon as you start overthinking this and start wondering if somebody's from fucking Somalia, you're going to not only stop helping other people, my concern is you're going to stop helping yourself. I mean, well, seriously, with the John Roderick of five years ago, You're the John right. Roderick who is finally discovering his rust abilities, You're would that right. John Roderick think twice about that and go, oh, I, like, that might be his mom's knife? No, it's true. It's true. I'm not just, saying you just, should be a dick. I'm just, just saying the fact that, you, that you are a refugee from a war-torn country does not give you the right. I mean, you're here in America now, Right. I mean, that's, to, that's, that's, that's lucky. Listen, you need to ticket people. Pro- you, des- you describe a 50-year-old man with one term. Like one, right? You, you got one bullet, one index card on this guy, and that's mm. that he's, he's from Somalia. How do you know that he isn't a huge cock? That's true. He could be a warlord. Because I'm thinking I might start telling people that I'm a Somalian refugee, and suddenly I get, a, if you like, a, a, a get-out-of-jail-free card. I get free parking for the rest of my fucking life. Mm, looking at you, I think <clears throat> most people would have a hard time believing that you were from Somalia. And that's just exactly the kind – that is exactly the kind of prejudice that I face at the garage every single day. People oh, come in there. Oh, my God. I hate, to, I hate to interrupt you, but yeah. John Demyanyuk yes. died March 17th, 2012. St. Patrick's Day. Just two months ago. Is that right? He lived until two months ago. He probably didn't even get to go to the parade. They love parades, you know. They have a St. Patrick's Day, I'm guessing, in Cleveland. There's a lot of Poles, ironically enough. Now he's, is he a Polish man? Was he at one of the big camps? Uh, he was Ukrainian. Uh, okay. Yeah, huh. and, you, and you know, the Ukraine, it's a... Ukraine. He was a Nazi in the Ukraine. Well, they, they, know, didn't, they didn't have an outpost there, did they? The Nazis? Yeah. Yeah, sure. They uh, they invaded. Uh, That's pretty far west, right? Uh, east. I, I thought the whole problem was they did the Napoleon thing again. How, how did they get all the way to the Ukraine? Well, the Ukraine is in between uh, Germany and Russia, so the, the, okay. they they took over the Ukraine um, on their way. To, <laughs> on their way, <laughs> on, their, on their way to Mo- uh, Moscow, but uh, but you know, at the time, of course, the Ukraine was part of the USSR, right? So it just seemed like we 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 always say Russia, meaning yeah, 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 that's so, that's like calling the United States Iowa. I but mean, he was so he was in the Ukraine, so he was a Russian. He was you know, and he was drafted into the Russian army, right. and then he was a prisoner of war. He was like a and, Soviet Vichy, right? Exactly. He was a Vichy guy. He Vichy. Uh, he he went with the uh, he went over to the other side. Okay, and so, boo, 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 dum, dum, yum, yuck. Boo, yeah. boo, boo him. Boo, now, dum, yum, yuck. Now, bad, listen, I, bad. I, I just, a couple questions about World War II. Now, is it, now, now, Hitler did a lot of bad stuff. He did. <clears throat> but is He's it, famous for that. Isn't it kind of, you tell me, it seems to me that, like, one of the stupidest things he did was, was trying to go to Russia. Is it, did, didn't Napoleon have kind of the same problem? He, he loves comparing himself to all these other guys. He's going to be the Caesar, Third Reich, going to live a thousand years. But, like, isn't it kind of stupid to try and march into into the Soviet Union? Was it wasn't that kind of a dumb move? You know, this is a lar- uh, this is a different podcast. We need to have a podcast where you and I refight so World War a different II. a different episode, or should we start a new property? Uh, yeah, no, a new property. I think How about uh, Hitler and stuff. And we, and we we could have that, see that'd be one where we could have guests because <laughs> I, I, there are so many. I have I've learned from People, the internet. Do you want to hold to account for something? <laughs> uh, there, 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 I've learned from the internet. There are a lot of guys who want to talk about World War II. And we could have them on the program, and they could tell us. You know, you know one, of, one of the guys from Silkworm. If you, a lot of Silkworm songs are, are about not a lot, but a few are about World War II. I think uh, one of the guys. I think uh, might have been the uh, the guitar player. What's his name? Not Tim, but the other guy. I think he's. Uh, did you ever meet Silkworm? Yeah. Well, I mean, I saw him. I, I, I can't say I met him. Yeah, I love Silkworm. I mean, I stood around backstage when they were backstage, and I don't know. They might have looked at me. At yeah, one Tim point. seems nice. But uh, no, I think you're. I think you're right, John. I think a lot of people in indie rock enjoy World War II. I think you could. A, a, a guy sent me a tweet yesterday saying, yeah. "Here's the tweet. Ready? Yeah. Discuss World War II. Oh, come on. Was that Mr. Detlefson? I have no idea who it was. I was like, <gasps> that, you this... you might be getting followed by Mr. Detlefson. Is that a, is that a thing? I, I don't know. He's the is guy that, that had the class the... where you'd have your final. Oh, right, Mr. Detlefson. Mr. Detlefson. I doubt he's on Twitter. You said he sounded like a real hard ass. I think I. You know, a man like him. 
I don't know. I, th- I think he's moved up the Bifrost and is deep in Asgard at this point. Mm. You know, mm. um, Hitler and stuff. I'm going to capture that. Yeah, um, Hitler and stuff. Mm, stuff. But isn't that so? A lot of the, you know, this is boring. You don't want to. You, you really don't want to invade Russia. And I'm saying this now. But that's because you got supplies. Listeners. You got the supply chain. You got to get all the way down. There's uh, all kinds of sources where it can break. is bad. It's just there's a lot of reasons. And it's cold. And you, it, it, there, yeah, that's right. It's very cold. <laughs> Uh, uh, to all of our listeners, if you if if you're ever in a situation where you've taken over Europe, and you and you have you have most of it in uh, in your iron grip, leave Russia alone. Just leave it alone. So you're you're saying don't have ambition. You're you're not you're not saying stop at the low hanging fruit, as we used to say. Mm-hmm. You're saying it's okay. Go up the tree a little bit and grab some fruit, but it doesn't mean you try to take down the whole orchard in the middle of winter. I'm saying that, that that's that, really not what you're saying at all. I'm saying it? steer steer your ambitions. <laughs> yeah, like. Turkey, by all means, invade Turkey. Wait, now, one, to, one, one to ten. How hard is Turkey? Pretty hard. The Turks. They want. They're, they're hard ass, right? They're fighters. They're fighters. Okay, so you give uh, them like a, you give them a seven. But there's a lot of reason to invade Turkey because you would gain control of the Dardanelles. You would gain control of access to the Black Sea. Okay. Then, that, then that's, what's, that's the mountain goats guy. Then what's Russia going to do? Yeah, the yeah John Dardanelle. <laughs> <laughs> was that was that a laugh or the uh, the consumption? <laughs> that was. Uh, somebody said to me at one point, "You guys need uh, you need cough uh, mutes or something." You, you tell him you need to shut up. I was like, "Cough mute, cough mutes." That's part of the show. What do you think we are? Cough mute. You know what that costs? Now, now in Hogan's Heroes, when they would threaten to send, I just had a couple more World War II questions. When they threaten, yeah. when they would threaten, I usually I think it was General Burkhalter. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes who's like the, the guy? Send you to the eastern front. To the eastern front. Now is the east? Who are they fighting on? Is that, that's not the Japanese. Who, who's no, on the eastern fighting front? The Russians. That's exactly. You're sent to the Russian front. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the Germans. So they're the ones moving east. You got yeah. you got the the Soviets holding the line. And then the whole reason we got the satellite nations uh, from uh, the post war on is they say no more, never again will a drop of Soviet blood be spilled on Soviet soil. If you're going to shoot us, you got you got to do it in Czechoslovakia. Was that the idea? Wow. Uh, my sense is. Should I that, save this? I should save this for Hitler and stuff. Yeah, I think I think that the idea of the the idea of Soviet communism uh, was that it was inevitable from their perspective. I thought the, we were going to talk about war. I didn't know we were going to talk about politics. <laughs> that the entire world was one day going to be communist. Right. Whether and and it, and it was going to have to. If revolutions weren't going to sweep the land, mm-hmm. then it, then the then the communism had to be. Had to be gifted to people in the form of uh, imposing it on them. And new transitive verbs. Yeah. Did, did you ever dally in communism? Oh, uh, like like all uh, young men uh, my age, I spent, <laughs> that, that is a very contradictory term. <laughs> I spent a few like all men who thirty years ago <laughs> were younger. <laughs> I, I spent a few <laughs> months in ninth grade. Very enamored with communism as an and I and I did like 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 you hear a lot of uh, college freshmen. I did the whole like you know uh, Soviet communism is not communism. Communism itself is you know Marxism itself. I mean I spent a lot of years in college right. arguing with Marxists. <laughs> uh, universities are full of Marxists, uh, but but no, I. I I am. I, I was. I was never like a. What uh, What held you back? Communist. I mean, you, you never got a hat. You never got a Che Guevara poster. You never pretended to read uh, uh, Das Kapital. You just it. You didn't even. You I, mean, probably, I read all that stuff. It's did just you, have that, you always owned your own means of production? <laughs> it, the, it, it always gets. <laughs> it always very quickly gets to the heart of the the the, the Hobbesian question: Is man basically good or is man basically evil? Mm-hmm. You know, communism, communism, and Marxism, ultimately depends on people making sacrifices for the greater good and and uh personal experience has shown that people are very much willing to make sacrifices for the greater good within limited contexts but well, they, the problem is it's not necessarily for the good when mao wants you to make steel in your backyard with a grill and then you don't get food and stuff mm. That's that. That's the part that drives me crazy. I was very interested in Marxism. Well, really, I was very interested the in Marx, pre- the premise Marxist of criticism. It, the premise of it is the, pr- that it's the for premise the great- of it is very idealistic. It's more idealistic than than Christianity. I don't want to talk about religion, but it's oh my very god, idealistic. You're talking about politics. Listen to you go. Oh my god! I think I just did politics. Oh my god! 
All I need now is oh. a Mitt Romney joke. <laughs> we we well, need Mitt Romney. Card. We need to make a card and put it on the wall. The day that Merlin started talking about politics. Is this that Jerry Lewis movie? <laughs> the, the day, the day, the click, the, the, the day the internet cried. Uh, yeah, I, John, I, we've got a Hitler and stuff <laughs> needs to happen. I don't know. It's probably you know what you know. What we should do. We should record it and never release it. I what? think people. Our Hitler and stuff podcast? Well, yeah. I mean, because I think it's something – well, let me put it this way. I don't want to be selfish. It's something that would help me a lot. And it's not, not – I don't know if other people – people are already getting so much help from me on a regular basis yeah. that – you know what? It might be selfish for me to keep it to myself, but I could feel like I could learn a lot about Hitler from you. Well, there, there I get this from people a lot because I, I think people want to want to know about the wars uh, because they sense that that learning about World War II or learning about World War One is going to – contextualize the world for them yeah or even just captain america or just make them understand what the story behind captain america is Mm -hmm. um and i think that that's true but but uh but you know i grew up i grew up literally soaking in world war ii i was literally soaking in it (laughs) i just spit coke (laughs) and (laughs) where did you get where did you get water soaking <clears throat> I'm so, sorry. Please continue. <laughs> there was so no- you're, 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 in Alaska, you're in Alaska. You got yeah. you got five channels, and you're literally soaking in war. I'm literally soaking in war. Okay. Uh, my dad was a World War II veteran, but I was I was from the you know, and I was when I was a young man, it was during the Vietnam War, and it was on television. <clears throat> I was not a man yet. Obviously, I was a child, but mm-hmm. but interested in war. But so I grew up knowing about World War II from the from, from my earliest times as a as a boy. And everything that I learned about World War II as I got older, I was able to add to this body of knowledge about it uh, so that I can't remember a time when I didn't have, I didn't have an understanding of the... Of, of, I, I remember when I didn't have an understanding of World War I. I had to go back and learn about World War I. But World War II I've always known about. Hmm. And, um, and so I can't, I can't, I can't picture... Uh, how you would be a, a a modern person and not have an understanding of 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 that conflict, you know, like to mm-hmm. go back and I, I, it's not that I wouldn't know where to start, but no, well, this is this is actually super interesting given how self aware you are because mm. you sound a little bit like a miner or possibly a terrier, mm. you, you, not the dog, the the, the diggers. You, you mm-hmm. sound like somebody where you say like I, you know, I, I was raised on a farm. I can't uh, imagine not understanding cattle like you, you you've been given that you have soaked in a war right and then there are other people wandering around going like i don't understand which end of milk right right but, but, right, but, right, right. but you but, but you know the facts now your father did he serve in france where, where was he no, no no he was a navy pilot in the pacific oh man that must have been scary well you know you're in an airplane so but i mean like even before like the, you know there were the whispers about the camps but like mm. people people knew what the japanese were doing to people right like they really they knew what happened if your plane went down anyway it was not going to be pretty that's why i have my father's pistol Hmm. he was issued a a a a 45 uh you know a a 1911 model 45 pistol as a as a navy pilot early in the war that he wore in a shoulder holster oh it's so cool and uh and then you know later on in the war the rumors started getting out that what a lot of pilots were doing was they were taking these forty five caliber bullets and they were using their knife to etch a cross in the in the the top of the bullet in the you know in the um, actual bullet the lead, the lead. Of the bullet. so that when the bullet hit it would explode the you know it would kind of it was a like a fake dum dum bullet the bullet itself would explode and do more damage and the Japanese uh you know, said that that's uh, that's unfair or that's bad. That's bad war making, and they they issued some kind of directive where they said if we capture a, an American pilot and he has one of these guns, these forty fives, we're just going to kill him right away because because the gun itself is unfair. <laughs> and so they that's took a, that's a pretty high level thinking. Yeah, so they they recalled the the U.S. Navy recalled all the forty fives, and they issued thirty eight, uh, you know, revolvers to all the pilots. And my dad, being a Roderick, he said that he had lost his. <laughs> and being and being erotic, they said, "Well, of course he did." Yeah. And they said, "Oh, all right, here's the thirty eight. So he so for the rest of the war, <laughs> he carried the forty five in the shoulder holster and the thirty eight in a, some other holster. What a fucking badass! Yeah, and then at the end of the war, he had to turn in his the, his uh, thirty eight, but he kept the forty five. 
And you, you still got that around. And I have it. And I actually took it to a gunsmith one time, and, and uh, they all gathered around it. And they were like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Because according to them, according to these guys, this 1911 model was actually the first model. It was issued in World War I. When you say 1911, you don't mean designed. You mean that, manufactured? That, no, that's when it was designed. Okay. That's what it's called. But this gun was it was in the first batch of them made during World War I. And he uh, and 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 I guess the gun was made, and then it sat in a in a arms depot for all the interwar years, just sat there on a shelf, and was issued to my dad in World War II. So this gun, it's and and they're all like, this gun would be worth a ton of money, thousands and thousands of dollars. Except sometime in the seventies, my dad had it reblued, uh, oh, refinished because it was like tattered or whatever he was like he took it in and had it re blued and they said yeah that that ruined it oh uh, no not as a gun they said it's a great gun but as a uh, as a collector's item it's if, he, still... if he had taken it on antiques roadshow that would have broken his heart yeah if it's still worth a ton it's still worth more money you know it's still worth money but it, but it, but it, it's Whoa. exactly the antiques roadshow thing if he had left the original finish is it a colt it's a Colt, yeah. United States pistol caliber 45 M1911. That's right. That is such a fucking cool looking gun. And that's a heavy, heavy gun, big gun. Well, when we, the one time, I don't want to talk out of school, but the one time, I don't want to come back to your dad because that's such an amazing story. But the one time we went and shot guns together. Yeah. Man, I, you know, and <clears throat> you shot one of those, didn't you? A 45. I had to stop at the 45. The 45 yeah. was just too much. Even yeah, with yeah. All, all the earplugs, it was just the, the, Recoil? So, what do you call so, it? Yeah, the recoil. It was just, it was like, I can't have this in my hand. It was too much. It was so, so loud. So you never did the 44 Magnum? No. You yeah, you the, were shooting the, for, Eric was doing great. Eric was hitting everything, if I yeah. remember. Eric well, was the one that was standing. Jonathan Rothman was a, was, was a, he was a dead eye dick. Yeah, cool. As we said. Cool. Yeah, cool. cool. Just, kidding, just kidding. This is a really, that is so cool that you've got that. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, I've spent my evenings. You know, and again, I'm, I'm a whacker at this, but I mean, I spent my evenings, you know, reading a lot on Wikipedia about something as like a, all the history I wish I would have known in high school I'm picking up now. Yeah. And just the stuff toward the end, you know, obviously the Baton Death March being, you know, kind of, I don't know if it's the apotheosis, but a great well known example, but it was just pretty miserable what they were doing to American, uh, prisoners. I'm just thinking that like, you know, it would suck to be captured by the Germans and go into an uncomfortable camp. But yes. pro- it, well, yes. it probably was not any Andersonville. Whereas no. what the Japanese were doing was just, just I mean, inhuman is the only way to put it. The way that they would treat American prisoners. Well, it was, was bad, but you have to also, I think, take into context that the Japanese living out there in you know, uh, you know, strung across all these archipelagos. They had no supplies either. Well, that's they why the not- march. That's why they had the march. There was yeah. like, well, that was the that was the the flimsy cover for it anyway. Was that we we couldn't waste ships on this. We already can't feed our own people. Right. No. No one was no one was uh, living high on the hog out there. The the thing, the thing that made the German camps, in addition to the uh, mass murder with gas, well, uh, not on the Americans uh, though. No, but well, okay. Let's say let's say a, a, a prisoner of war camp in Germany. I mean, the German uh, uh, like. Prison guards were drinking champagne, French champagne, French champagne from, from the Champagne region. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and they were probably, you know, they were probably probably the camp uh, commander was practicing his oil painting in the afternoons, <laughs> listening to Wagner, <laughs> listening to Wagner. Whereas in, doing in, that really gay thing, where you act like you're conducting the, the Japanese <laughs> uh, uh, prisoner of war camps. The camp guards themselves were eating roaches. They were, yeah, you know, right. eating ro- roach sandwiches, and so there wasn't like much left over for the for the Americans. But I guess what I'm getting at is, do you have you talked? Did when did you ever get to talk to your dad about that? Was he aware of what he was facing if he went down over the Pacific? Oh, absolutely. But those guys were all 22 years old. I mean, was I aware <laughs> when I was 22 years old what I was facing if I? Whatever. <laughs> if I... <laughs> no, please, please continue. I, I want to hear. I want to hear the part of your great lost years that was like the Baton Death March. Was anyway, I one aware? time, one time I'd had a lot to drink, and then they randomly shot three of us for no reason. <laughs> My buddy was infected and had dysentery, so we yeah. went and got another round. I could have. I could have lost a leg just as easily as one of those guys. You know what's great though is when you're 22, you really do think it's like that. You yeah. really, you really, really do think that you are a survivor at that point. And if you're 22 years old and fighting in a war, you really do think that it's like 
Ain't, ain't no thing. I mean, my dad, flew, he did not fly uh, fighter planes. He flew DC-3s or uh, C-47s, the transport planes. Okay. But he tells all these stories about like, oh, there was an anti-aircraft uh, gun on the bridge, and so we flew under the bridge. And they couldn't <laughs> get the gun down fast enough, you know, we flew under. Or, or uh, he he tells a story, and I, 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 I how, how do you verify this? There's no way to do it. You but don't. You see, that's fucking awesome. He tells a story of... <laughs> He, he, he comes through the clouds in his airplane. And he got and he, thrown out of college. He, he sees, fought in Japan. <laughs> he sees a uh, he sees a plane coming at him, and, he's, and it's coming straight at him. And he's looking at it in the distance, and he's like, "What kind of plane is that?" You know, like um, it, it's it's pointed directly at him, so it's much harder to tell what kind of plane it is. And he's looking at the plane, and it's coming straight at him, and he's thinking, "What is that? I don't know what it is." And then he realizes it's a zero. It's a Japanese zero. Oh, it's shit. flying straight at him, and he's flying straight at it. And, and th- uh, those guys are super maneuverable, right? They're super maneuverable, and my dad's plane is not. Right. And so he's looking, and he does, and the, the, the that plane's not veering off a of course, and his plane isn't veering off course. And in his version of the story, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, failing to know what else to do, he opens the side window in the cockpit, pulls this forty five that I <laughs> still own out, <laughs> sticks it out the window, and, and fires like. <laughs> Eight rounds at the at the zero, and then grabs the stick and pulls straight up and goes up into a cloud. And the... <laughs> did he have a lot of stories like that? Ne- never, never saw the plane again. So he assumed that he shot it down. The zero didn't come after him, so he assumed that he, he shot it down. He scared him off with his pistol. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was my. They really were the greatest generation. They really were. They were the greatest, greatest generation. Possibly greatest. most most full of shit generation. But that, that's a that's <laughs> an amazing. That is the most. You ever read that Tom Brokaw book, The Most Full of Shit Generation? <laughs> yeah. No, I couldn't get through the first chapter. Oh, uh, my favorite story of of my dad is he uh, he said he was you know he was land, landing supplies, landing ammunition, and and so what he would do is he'd land. Uh, the uh, the Americans would would be uh, taking over an island. And the and the goal was always to get to the airstrip, right? Mm-hmm. The Japanese would have an airstrip on an island. The Americans would invade. They'd be trying to get to the airstrip. And when they'd get to the airstrip, they would park a jeep with an American flag on it at the end of the airstrip, and that was the sign that that they had that they had seized the the strip. And then my dad in in a transport with a with guns and ammunition and and medical supplies would land on the newly captured strip. They'd throw the bullets out, load the plane up with wounded, spin it around, and get back out of there. And the, the fighting is going on all around the strips. Oh God, and this thing—this is a lumbering giant. You're not this. This is a lot of well, it's, no. Surprisingly, you know, maneuverable uh, really? planes, but 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 certainly a transport plane, like unarmed. So he's coming in on final approach to this uh, to this strip where he has seen the jeep parked at the end of the runway, and he's he's coming in. Coming in hot, full of uh, full of full of bullets, and as he touches the wheels down on the airstrip, he sees a guy run out of the jungle, jump in the jeep, and peel out, <laughs> spin around, and get the hell out of there. And bullets start coming out of everywhere. And uh, he he's you know he's hauling ass down the runway but he's 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 it, he's he's committed now he's too far along to like pull up and and take back off so he runs the plane down to the end of the runway and the japanese are coming out of the jungle he spins the plane around heads back down the runway the other direction with the with the the uh, the loadmaster in the back of the plane just throwing crates of bullets out the out the door just hucking them out, trying to get, trying to get the plane light enough that it can get back oh. up off the ground. And as they're running down the running down the runway, I mean, they get back up, but they're 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 just hucking stuff, hucking stuff out. And they, you know, got off the ground and made it out of there. Plane full of bullets, but it's it's it's, it's completely insane. I, I, I uh, my my anxiety would forbid me being very useful in that situation. <clears throat> I just regret. That I had no life to give for my country. I, I regret that I didn't have a. Uh, I, I I sometimes regret that I did not join the the army. I know that that's crazy, 
I know at the time when I was 19, there was, there was nothing I was going to do less than join the army. Right. But now that I'm old, I look back and go, well, I mean, what the hell was I doing? Yeah. I was doing anything. Yeah, it's a good way to feel pretty useless. But I mean, same thing with Captain America. He didn't. He didn't. You know, he kept trying to join four different times. Four F every time. Four F. Four F. Four F. And then they oh, gave he's him a little guy. He was he's a, a little. real little guy. But then they gave him that formula. And I'm just saying, if you, I don't want to trivialize this story. That's not what I do. But I'm just saying, if you had those rust powers, it could have really made a difference. If I'd had the rust powers, but the problem with having powers is you don't. You, they, you know, they don't want you in the army. They want you in the secret. They want you in some special secret. Oh, like, in, like in Shield, but you want to be out there with the grunts. You want to be. You want to be out there on the front line, rusting things. Right, and then and and that's that's always been my problem with the CIA. Like I, I know at a certain point, there was a certain point pretty early on where the CIA was never going to recruit me as a <laughs> as just a an agent. You know what I mean? When, when when did that awareness really really settle on you? I was I I was pretty sure even by the age of twenty that I had already. That I had already uh, jeopardized my chances of of being in the CIA, fundamentally jeopardized them. Well, uh-huh. but the thing is, now I still feel like the CIA could recruit me, but I would be an asset, if you know what I mean. I wouldn't oh, be an agent. you could I would still be... you could still be the English guy with the bombs, but you you might not be the one like right there putting it out, you, exactly. right? You definitely exactly. probably have a beard. Yeah, I would, I would, what I would have is I would have, I would be the one with the beard and I would have a handler. I would have a CIA agent that was, that was handling me. I wouldn't have, I personally would not have a license to kill. I would, you know, my license would, would, would be under the umbrella of someone else's license. You get, you get a sub license to kill. I'd get a sub license to kill. Mm -hmm. And, and that, you know, that's just, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'll, I'll take it. But it's uh, but it's just not as satisfying as being, you know, a spy myself. I well, would, you, well, you, but I mean, you know, but you'd still be serving. You'd still yeah, be you still be doing what you're good at. You can't always be looking backward on those things. I, I, could, I could be in Damascus, walking down the street in a mm-hmm. in a in a in white a, in a robe, suit in a with, a, with a sword cane and <laughs> uh, and a big beard. And uh, when uh, when agents came through, I would potentially be running a safe house, or I would be, you know, I'd be there like. I'd be able to say, oh, sounds like it's the jackal again. Oh. My, my old nemesis. Oh, see, I, I got to tell you, buddy, I think that would be so much cooler than being in the standard CIA. If you were in the secondary secret CIA and you were fighting the jackal mm-hmm. in Damascus, the you know, I, I, I'd love to work in uh, one of those uh, Three Days of the Condor offices. I mean, I wouldn't want to be killed during lunch, but I, 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 I love that movie so much. I just thought it was so cool. They're in a townhouse, like doing spy stuff. I just thought yeah. that would be the best thing in the world. You gotta wonder. Somewhere in San Francisco, there's a townhouse where, where people are doing spy stuff. I think it's in and our you neighborhood. You probably you drive by it, it all the time. Here's the thing. I think it's in our neighborhood. Well, you know how many of the places? Not just hand jobs. I found out another one. There's several hand job places around my place. We all know that. Let's take it as red. I huh? just found out that there's a yogurt place that's actually it's actually mahjong for money. Really? If you can pull something like that off two blocks away from a police station, there's a pretty good chance that, that somebody's here in a bathrobe fighting the jackal. Wait, it's a yogurt place, but you play mahjong for money in in the back somewhere? It's 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 even more complicated than that. It's it's a storage place for a yogurt place. <laughs> Cause you know what? If it was a yogurt place, that's what they'd be looking for. Oh my god. Right? They're so, they're so inscrutable. You put the you put 